Good evening. I'm Brownfield anchor reporter Megan Grebner. Tonight, uh, thank you for joining us for our strategic commodity market webinar with UMB. This evening, we have uh, Lance Albin with UMB and Travis Bruner with Sunrise. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, Megan. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We're uh, excited to have a conversation tonight about all of the craziness that's been going on in 2020 and where we're headed to 20 into 2021. So before we get started though tonight and in just a couple of housekeeping notes, the chat is disabled, but if you do have questions, this is your opportunity to ask questions as well. And we'll get to those as we can. Uh, there's a Q&A button along the bottom and you'll be able to submit those questions and we'll get those to both Travis and, and Lance as we get started. So as before we get into the nitty gritty <laughs> and to talk about all of the craziness that's been for 2020, I wanna give uh, Lance and, and Travis just a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, Travis, let's start with you. All right, thank you, Megan. So uh, my name is Travis Brunner. I'm the uh, owner founder of Sunrise Agribusiness Solutions based out of Hayes, Kansas, um, with uh, two remote sites, one in Kansas City and one in uh, Salina. Um, we are a, a ag service consulting firm, um, basically that we help farmers with risk management, um, help them do planning sessions, look at break-evens, and really help them make uh, an informed plan decision in their both their crop production and their and their cattle their livestock operation thank you so much for joining us this evening we're excited to have this conversation uh lance uh, a couple of minutes for you as well you bet and first i'd like to add my appreciation for travis joining us travis has quickly built a, a great reputation and um, serving his clients well so we're thrilled to have him here tonight and to join us in this webinar. Um, my name is Lance Alvin. I'm the president of UMB Bank's agribusiness division. We're one of the top 30 or 30 largest ag lenders in the United States with ag lending dating back uh, through the whole course of the bank's history, which now dates well over 100 years. So we, um, we serve clients from Illinois to Arizona and uh, many, many places in between. So we've got a, an expansive footprint and we're privileged to work with some truly terrific farmers and ranchers throughout the United States. And so one of the things that we are um, always in conversation with our customers about is how to market grain, how to market cattle, when to when to pull the trigger on, on either selling um, bushels in the bin or bushels that might yet be in the field. And uh, one, one thing that we're not is we're not, a, we're not, a, while we do our best effort to offer good sound advice, we're not a, we're not a, a specialist in that field. So we're happy tonight to partner with Travis and Sunrise to uh, to get their opinion and, and some, some best strategies and practices that can be employed uh, for farmers as we, as, as you said, Megan, as we close out 2020 and look forward uh, to 2021. So I think uh, the the elephant in the room is obviously the volatility that has been and 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 what has been 2020, whether it's COVID, whether it's been black swan events in, in the market. As we look back at, at this year, what are some things that that producers, whether uh, livestock producers or we're talking grain farmers and and other crop farmers as, as well, need to think about? Uh, as they look at this year and they start to look ahead to next year. So maybe we talk, start with a, a little bit of an overview of what's happened so far as it relates to volatility in 2020. I, I think that's a, I mean, that's absolutely, obviously a great lead into tonight's conversation. So um, again, the Sunrise and the Sunrise model is really working with farmers and ranchers across the Midwest um, to help them again, plan, right? And so, uh, all the plans that we did last spring, last winter, spring, um, got thrown major curveballs, as you mentioned. So um, there were some black swan events that, that took place. I remember sitting in a, in a conference in Orlando um, back in, in you know, early to mid-February, and there was this thing called COVID and, and what may or may not transpire. And at that point, things were shaping up to, to be a fairly, um, you know, you know, mute type of market. And, you know, 30 to 60 days later, uh, we've got the government shut down. We've got, you know, cattle, you know, basically numbers on feed that, you know, nowhere to go. You got 
you know, this 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 massive corn crop with you know what looked like the massive corn crop coming, you know, facing in, in the in the in the eyes of the U.S. and and this spiral effect, and it just seemed like the entire market and the whole complex uh, was completely upside down, and that includes um, most or all your advisors to to your producers to your uh, feedlot managers, your, your ethanol plant, all your demand users. Um, everybody was was you know had the same same uh, ideas and same thoughts on their on their plan is we'll wait for harvest and, and we'll take advantage of cheaper basis levels and cheaper you know flat price and and then uh, we have these weather events or what I refer to as you know maybe no weather events so um, you, you come in in August 1st thinking we're going to have a, a massive corn crop and you have this uh, Durat show that happened in in Iowa and and it went ripped through parts of uh, the Midwest and then no rain, right? No rain in late July and August, and the crop continued to get smaller and smaller, and there was a lot of panic on the street. So what Sunrise tries to do is put a discipline uh, plan in place. We uh, we like to think about doing um, risk management and be conservative in our approach, um, but we also customize and tailor that plan that fits the individual risk tolerance and what their uh, their plans are. So. Many, many things that you know, threw some major curveballs uh, to light, but what does it also create some great opportunities? And, and again, we just need to be smart and, and disciplined and, and, and relaxed. And sometimes, uh, probably that last one is hard for us to do is, is be relaxed in this type of environment. So stick to the plan is our, is our uh, motto. So before I, I get into some follow up questions, Lance, I'll let you. Uh, talk about uh, where we are at this point from your perspective and the banking and, and lending aspect of it. You know, working on the, on the bank side is what price do we receive? And if, if that price was $3 that we were staring at a while back for corn or, you know, the weaker prices we saw through the summer, that was, you know, there's, that's a, that's a tougher um, outlook than where we are today. So certainly the, this recent run-up has helped things and, and, and uh, sure glad to see that. In terms of what Travis shared about, you know, the events of this year and having a plan and sticking to that plan, that's really what we encourage our customers to do is to, is to have a plan that's well thought out, that's written down, that's agreed upon by the principles of the operation. Uh, sometimes that even involves maybe putting a signature and a date next to it. So uh, when we do have that run up that we say, well, when we said when we got to this price, we'd sell. We're at that price. We need to sell some. And so I think, you know, as Travis uh, used the word plan and sticking to that plan, uh, that's something we really encourage folks in as well. And 2020 has, has, has uh, stressed that idea because we've seen, we've seen, some real movements in prices. Uh, we've dealt with the global pandemic that you know just is probably has everybody at maybe a, a just a bit out of step at times uh, compared to what what normal was prior to. So I think that idea of having a plan and sticking to it and uh, looking looking for looking for opportunities to hit singles and doubles is is really great and it's it's the thing we encourage people and we always tell people you're not gonna you know you're probably not gonna top pick the market you know you're not gonna get the high price of the year, you know, maybe everybody else at the coffee shop did if, according to what they what they say, but it's okay to not top tick the market. Uh, we just want to, you know, hit singles and doubles. You know, if you could be a, you know, a top third marketer, uh, your fund's going to be successful over time. And so that idea of having a plan and sticking to it is part of achieving that. I mean, we all like home runs or triples uh, when we can get them, obviously. How difficult or has it been more challenging? And Travis, maybe this is a question uh, for you, for, for folks watching this volatility in the market and, and seeing prices run up to kind of stick to their guns and, and stick to their plan. And how important is that in the long run? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And, and I, always, I always tell folks uh, as I sit down and talk to them across the kitchen table and, and working with a plan that. That I that I love volatility. Like we need volatility that creates opportunities. Uh, and 2020 is challenging those right those those ideas and those thoughts. But again, we we like to look at trying for singles and doubles. And and my experience would tell you, and, and all the research will tell you. And I think if if we were in a in a in an auditorium today, if you ask the farmers, 
you know, a survey and ask them to raise their hands, how many of you feel that you do a good job marketing grain? Um, I think very few hands would go up. Um, 80%, it's a well-known fact, but 80% of the grain gets sold in the bottom 20% of the market. And so I appreciate what Lance is saying about, you know, trying to get in the top third. Um, our service, I would love to say, hey, we, we, that's, our, that's what we're aiming for. Um, but we, we, we tend to do more conservative approach. Uh, incremental sales, we diversify our, our hedging and our, and our risk management and cash sales uh, using different strategies, different types of marketing uh, alternatives that are available in your particular area. Uh, again, we customize those approach for what is available in your area, your, your elevator of choice. Um, but again, for us, it's really about putting a plan in place, sticking to the plan, and and doing small incremental sales along the way to 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 to, to satisfy, you know, the, the operation and, and and look at cash flows and look at you know break evens. Um, and and it's hard for us to you know we're not a one size fit all operation, and that's why we have people scattered across the Midwest serving our farmer customers because you know folks in South Central you know Nebraska that are under you know aeration they prefer to maybe be more aggressive than say a guy in Southwest Kansas that maybe can't control uh, Mother Nature with with water. So uh, again, we tailor the plan and and we uh, we focus on the plan. Uh, I haven't used that idea or that approach with with like Lance says like sign sign off, Mr. Mr. You know, client or farmer. But but really, I, I think uh, I think what what he's trying to say is, is is right. You know, develop the plan, stick to the plan, execute the plan. And, and one of my biggest fears in years like this is people deviate from that, and so next year they they won't want to make a decision because of what happened last year. And those those can be really really costly mistakes. So. Uh, work with your your advisor. Work with the the, the trusted dame you're working with, and, and stick with those folks because I think in the long run you'll be better for it. We've seen some aid packages come through that have helped, and and will um, ultimately, I, I'm assuming, help some farmers. In in the bottom line, obviously things are are different, and 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 that's not consistent across every commodity or every uh, livestock aspect of it. How does that impact what guys are doing and thinking about, uh, and gals uh, for that matter, uh, heading into the end of this year? And, and are there other things that they need to consider with that additional aid coming in? So uh, my encouragement is always to, is to make taxes part of your planning strategy and grain sales and cash flow part of that planning strategy. Uh, for year in, not to make it the sole focus. Uh, if we if we run too hard from the tax um, from the tax issue, we might make grain marketing mistakes that we later regret. So it's it's part of the overall decision, but I, I'd be reluctant to make it a primary factor in deciding when to sell grain or cattle. I think that's I think that's a great point, and and um, you know though you can't um, completely uh, know or assume type of you know, government aid or uh, subsidized payments that may or may not be made. But we do wanna look at you know, farm bills and, and different types of uh, risk measures around that um, based on, again, uh, proposed or, or you know, the PLC versus ARC and those type of things. So uh, again, they're, they're important to the operation. They're uh, obviously a, um, something that we don't plan on, but uh, we also wanna make sure that we that we you know maximize the opportunities when, when they are available. So looking ahead, so where are we today as things set? Um, we know harvest is progressing uh, across most of the country. How are things looking for us to finish out this quarter of 2020? I think from a from a production standpoint, I mean I we're definitely on the downhill slide of 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 harvest. So we've got uh, and many parts of the area that we serve in the Midwest, our our corn harvest is you know is down to you know the last 10 or 15, 20 percent, um, while you know the soybeans are are all but done. And then uh, obviously you know grain sorghum is is still underway. Um, most of our clients again here in Kansas and Nebraska and Texas are uh, definitely either wrapping things up or uh, would would have wrapped up maybe towards the end of this week or next. 
with this little weather event that we've seen over the last couple couple of days, maybe we'll slow that down. Um, as far as logistics, I think I think the industry in a whole has has done a good job of handling a large, a relatively large crop coming at them with little disruption of harvest. Normally, we get a a rain delay or two and gives guys and, and, and gals time to re, refocus or reshuffle logistics, whether it's trucks or uh, rail cars. Um, we're, we're very fortunate that, that we've seen this strong, strong demand, both on the Pacific Northwest, which we, we refer to as the, the PNW and out of a center of golf. So we've seen some great sales to China uh, and basically every commodity code that you can uh, dream up. So that's been, that's been really encouraging. Um, and it's also created, like you mentioned, Megan, this, this great volatility both in futures and, and local bases. And so from a flat price standpoint for farmers that do have open bushels and, and open uh, receipts at the elevator, it gives them a great opportunity to price higher, higher levels that we think people should take advantage of. Lance, your thoughts? Well, I, I guess I was one to ask Travis what to do with those open bushels. Uh, that, that might be the question of the night or the thing people are most curious about. So uh, for, for folks who have open fall bushels, specifically Milo bushels, maybe uh, Travis, would you offer an opinion on, on what those folks might be considering or thinking about as they weigh those decisions? So yeah, so again, when, when you look at when you look at Milo specifically here in the in the in Kansas, I keep saying that we have one customer. So we have a lot of a lot of chips on China. So if China decides to stage left or pause, it could create quite a, a rippling effect across the Midwest. Um, we don't see that happening anytime soon. We think China is in it to win it. So the, I think they're here for a bit longer. But as everybody knows that, you know, that is a bit of a wild card. And so a lo lot of elevators here in Kansas have, have crossed the five dollar mark. Um, much, much higher than we ever could have, you know, thought of. Um, I've been doing this again a, a long time. And I can tell you, unless, you know, on, on one hand, how many times uh, we've, we've been able to sell cash Milo at harvest time with a five in front of it. And a lot of co-ops, a lot of grain elevators across the state are now uh, paying over five bucks a bushel. Um, so it's obviously a great opportunity um, to take advantage of these higher prices. And obviously, you know, most guys have, have grain sales much less than that. But again, it's a great way to average your sales up. And, and we like to say that there's only one way to take advantage of the opportunity or the market rally, and that's got to sell it. So, um, and we focus on not only this year, but next year. So as a producer of agricultural products, when you sell something, we strongly remind folks that, yeah, you know, as, as, as a producer, you always want the grain to go up. And so uh, we also think there's some, some opportunities to take advantage of for 2021. Um, with this recent rally as well. China is kind of the wild card on a lot of commodities right now, soybeans, corn. Uh, there's been increased beef sales into China and some of the pork sales uh, have been the weekly, when I look at the weekly exports <laughs> sales for pork, um, there's been some pretty impressive numbers. How does that play into the rest of uh, what maybe folks are thinking about, maybe they don't necessarily think about China, but how that is present some opportunities for producers to maybe uh, secure some better prices, uh, knowing that the demand is hot right now. Yeah, so when we when we look at um, you know the cash prices, we also look at what what is it worth to the to the to the folks that are buying the product, and obviously. Uh, Grain sorghum is a is a the product that gives the Chinese the non-GMO product, you know, for their non-GMO uh, poultry and, and pork and and their uh, their liquor of choice called baju, and, and so there's obviously some great strong demand for for again U.S. commodities in general. Um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of a lot of emphasis and a lot of chips that China continues to purchase, and I think we got to remember that the southern hemisphere will come online sometime in March or April with the South America crop that then we will take, US will take second seed to those areas of the world. So we gotta be very cautious, even though we're optimistic, we need to be very uh, cautious on, on allowing ourselves to be um, too bullish in these type of markets. Um, we've had this rally in the, in, the, in the corn market, the soybean market, um, complacency in the, in the years past, um, you know, didn't prevail. We'd get out in front of it and, and sell the carries, of, you know, meaning that the, the next month or the next six months, the grain prices were higher. 
um, we actually see um, cash prices inverted, meaning it's worth more today than tomorrow, which is a strong signal of, of, of shrinking, shrinking supply, increased demand. That's, that's a strong signal to sell. And so um, though we wouldn't tell people that, you know, you're all in or all out, but again, we need to, we need to reward the market when the, when the market makes these significant moves and, and you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't take advantage of the opportunity. We're getting, go ahead, Lance. Well, I, I was just going to add quickly that in the past few years, we have seen rallies that have been pretty fleeting in nature. Uh, this one seems to have more strength or staying power, but nonetheless, it's probably good to remember how fleeting these moments can be. And it's just an encouragement to, to think about that and that, you know, remember how, how things can turn in a way from it. So we've been talking a lot about marketing strategies and, and, and those conversations and some principles behind it. What are some things that we need to consider on a, a consistent basis when we're looking to hit those singles and doubles? Yeah, I think it's just like, again, I don't want to uh, you know reiterate the plan, right? So sticking to the plan. So um, again, working with with a, with a banker, working with your break-evens, knowing what the cost of production is, it's really... Um, surprising to me when we, when, 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 when I, or one of my, one of my sales reps goes out to the field and we ask a producer, you know, Mr. Farmer, what is your break even? They really don't know. And, and I think that's what we try to you know, make and encourage people to sit down with us in the, in the, in the office. We, we call it the off season. So in the, in the wintertime, sit down with us. We'll help you build a break even. Um, and then put a, a baseline or a plan around a certain percent of bushels in in the in that type of a uh, environment to protect you know the break evens. Um, there's great opportunities already for next year. You know with the with the recent rally, we've seen you know Dees corn Dees 2021 corn uh, push the four dollar mark. You know slightly over four March. You know a little over you know four or five four ten. Um, you know soybeans are you know you know 970, 980. Um, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, again, it's, it's, it's a good thing and we need to remember that it's a good thing. And, and so we just need, again, you know, work on the, the, the structured plan and, and a disciplined plan and stick to it. Lance, I'm going to have you lean in when you uh, answer, but let's talk a little bit about the lender's perspective when it comes to that marketing perspective or marketing principle. You bet. And my apologies if you weren't able to hear me. Usually that's not a complaint. Usually people want me turned down. So uh, yeah, from the lender's perspective, again, uh, we like to see people who take advantage of strength. You know, we, we see that as astute management. Um, we, we, we're encouraged and applaud uh, farmers and producers who, who are willing to say, hey, you know what, I don't know if this is the top or not, but I know I'm going to have production. I know this is great. This is more than my break even. I know I'm profitable here. It works in my cash flow and I'm going to take it. We We'd like to see that. And if that market keeps going up, you probably got a little more to sell. And if you don't, well, you might even be able to lock in some into the into the future crop as, as Travis has alluded to. So we like to see people, you know, from the banking perspective, we like to see people uh, see these opportunities. And uh, that that's, that's again, I think, a, a, we think a, a sign of astute management and somebody who's who's willing to hit singles and doubles. And we keep using the baseball analogy, which I guess is okay since there's a World Series game two, uh, probably just underway tonight. So um, singles and doubles will get you to the Hall of Fame, right? So uh, it, it doesn't have to be a, a, a home run contest. And, and we like to see that because uh, especially if you, if you carry a fairly significant debt load, which, you know, to be, um, to be operating at scale in production agriculture often is part of the deal. Um, you just want to be mindful of, you know, how am I going to make these payments? Um, and so, you know, a good, maybe a good place to start is, okay, what are my, what are my total, you know, debt obligations for the year? And if I see a good price, maybe I sell the bushels to cover that. Uh, might be a good place to start. And uh, if you, if you were to explain that and show that to your banker, I think you'll get a, you'll get two thumbs up and a smile on their face. We always like two thumbs up. <laughs> We, we we like to we like to say that there's uh you're not going to go broke making a profit so um again uh I, I think i think lance said it quite well so how important is that balance sheet and not just knowing your your break evens but i mean do we need to drill it down and and know what it's going to cost to produce an acre or or a 
bushel of corn or an acre of corn to, to really specifically right now have those details and know what every cost is? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer from the bank perspective. We, we think the more you drill down on that and even by a per farm or per field basis, the better you know, you know where you're making money and where you're losing money or breaking even. Uh, we, you know, break even, you know, lots of work and effort and interest costs and wear and tear on machinery and emotion and all that. So lots to put into, you know, maybe a, a farm or a field uh, part of your operation that if you really were to study it over time has been a break even uh, endeavor that it's, it's, you know, that's just an inefficient use of your resources and your um, most importantly, your time. So we like to see people be as granular as possible in their analysis of their break evens and what you know, where the farm's making money and where it isn't, um, those are really, really critical things to know. And the, again, the most astute managers will have those things drilled down and, and they'll make decisions, you know, based on that. If if um, if that farm's demanding a high cash rent, you know, it's, you know, it's either a break even or a marginally profitable farm, you'll know to walk away. And the, the only way to really know, to be able to do that is to know what that, what that unit does on, a, you know, on a, on a more, medium or long-term basis. Just for a uh, I I would... <laughs> Do we need to lean in? No, I was going to say for anybody who's who's watching or is in the audience, if you have questions, submit them. We'll get those asked to Travis and Lance as well. Um, I was just trying to take a little second <laughs> to let them ask questions too. I don't need to dominate the conversation all the time, but go ahead, Travis. No, I, I, all I was going to say is, you know, I, I think, you know, as, as Lance mentioned, you know, really being a business mind, right? So, I mean, you talk about the debt load that some of these operations are taking and, and the, the amount of risk that they're taking. You know, you just really need to understand that it is a business and and the, and the risk that, that we go through in production ag, uh, I think sometimes we, we almost get um, muted to what risk we really are taking. So when, the, when you have opportunities that are present, present in 2020, um, it's so important to, to maximize these returns. I mean, uh, you know, when I sit down and do break evens, most of my clients, our clients at Sunrise will say, if we can only make 50 or 60 bucks an acre profit, uh, we need to do that. And with the yields that we've seen and the prices that we've seen, um, I, I see very few, if any, clients that can't meet those objectives. So um, the other thing I think, you know, one thing we, we, we're talking about 2021 and, and the opportunities to maybe start looking at um, locking in some of those, the inputs are big too, right? So uh, fertilizer is down, you know, some of your seed costs, you know, guys are starting to, you know, uh, ask for sales already for, for seed for next year. Um, and there's some opportunities for, you know, early discounts. And at, when you start talking about input costs um, over the last five, six, seven years, our, our nitrogen costs are lower. So there's opportunities to start locking in some of those input costs and selling some deferred sales, because if you look at the cost of bushel of sale versus a, a, a pound of in for your fertilizer program, um, I, I think you'll, you'll find that uh, it takes less bushels today to pay for that nitrogen source. And so we look at it from that perspective again, and I think it's really to be mindful as a business um, owner of your operation to, to maximize, uh, you know, not only this year, but, you know, years beyond, so. Quite the slug here in the last four years, five years of you know having limited opportunities to lock in grain sales where we like the price and to lock in some inputs where we also like the price. Um, it's been kind of the reverse of that some uh, for for a period here. So just the opportunity that we have really on both sides of the profit equation right now are pretty favorable. So again, we're we're encouraging action uh, maybe on on both sides of that ledger. It seems like that's something that we haven't, um, there haven't been two, both pieces of those puzzles uh, present at the same time uh, for in recent years. So is this kind of a unique opportunity uh, to put producers in a better position going into 2021, knowing that there's still some volatility uh, uh, present and likely to continue in the market? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's um, as Travis described it that you know the the prices available 
are favorable. Maybe you don't sell the last bushel. Um, you've got Milo unpriced. Maybe you do sell the last bushel. Uh, but corn and beans, um, you know, maybe there's a little room there. So maybe you want to hang on to a little bit, see where this market takes us. Um, but you know, to, to to move fairly aggressively there makes sense. And then on the on the input side, it, again, oil's down, oil's been down. Um, so we're seeing some relief in some feed stocks. So, you know, it, it just makes sense uh, across the board. If, again, if you lock in decent uh, profit here uh, or have it kind of in the bank for 2020, uh, you got a chance to, to lock in some favorable things for 2021. It just makes sense to me. Um, I grew up farming with my granddad and he always said, if, if something worked last year, don't try it this, you know, the following year. So if you if you've kind of ran a bit more uh, hand to mouth over the last year or two, that's kind of worked. Uh, so to follow my granddad's advice, if, you know, not, if it works, don't try it again. So you know, looking forward, it might be here's an opportunity where locking in sales and input uh, price input costs is uh, maybe the prudent thing to do. We talked a lot about uh, grain and, and those types of commodities tonight. Let's talk a little uh, outlook and, and maybe a little strategy as we look at the cattle sector. Um, how does that look as we wrap up this quarter and we head into 2021? Well, the, the cattle were looking, you know, favorable, you know, a couple months ago. And we, you know, after we came up of, of the initial shock of COVID and, and some of these really, really hard, you know, sharp losses in cattle and, and having you know, uh, you know, feeders, feeders in, in the, in the low dollars and the, and the fats in the, in the 80, 85 cent range. We've seen this great rally back and this great recovery. And here recently in the last, you know, you know, three to four weeks, we've seen, you know, some, some of those rallies cut in half. Uh, again, um, we, we see, we see some folks, especially the, the, you know, the guys that are feeding, you know, live cattle or, you know, these fat cattle, they'll, they'll sit and do a break even and, and, and buy puts or, or, you know, lock in a, a minimum maximum strategy um and so those have been obviously favorable when we when we ran feeders back up to 150. um you know if you if you look at if you look at the the, the cattle on feed numbers you know we're talking 103 to 105 percent you know cattle on feed i think when those cattle got cheap uh back in february and march uh i think you had uh, the cattle guys were kind of all in um you know filling up these yards uh buying you know some some lighter cattle because they were you know fairly you know would look like to be you know, a good buyer they were cheap uh, a lot of those are coming coming uh, coming to the market and uh, so I think you got to be you know cautious on cattle um, you know as we as we go into the the, the the tail end of the fourth quarter so do we also get a little nervous seeing inputs go up a little bit on the livestock side of things yeah I think I mean if you just look at flat price on corn you know we, we, we took we took these corn from 320 up here to you know almost contract highs of 423 and three quarters. I mean we've rallied uh, corn basically a dollar in, in some areas in Southwest Kansas, for example. We were seeing 25 to 30 over you know Garden City corn trade. Now we're seeing values at you know 70 and 75 over um, being the bid. So you've had you've had this dollar to a dollar 25 cash rally. Um, again, like I said, you, you had the whole market kind of upside down. You had feedlots that were not buying corn. He had uh, ethanol plants not buying corn, and now everybody's chasing that that farmer bushel that um, is, is harder to get a hold of. Uh, we think it's going to be harder to get hold of once the trucks and the combines get parked in the shed and cleaned off. We think uh, farmers have done a good job of selling what they needed for cash flow purposes for for year end uh, tax reasons. Uh, we also have have these government payments that came in um, good timing or bad timing, but I think it's going to halt additional sales um, right or wrong. That'll be yet to be determined in January February, but um, but yeah, I mean, you, you talk an average steer is going to feed, you know, eat, uh, you know, 60 bushels of corn. All of a sudden, what you thought you were locking in, you know, a 30, 40, 50, 60 dollar head profit now is no pun intended, but now it's ate up. So just purely in the, in the price of corn. Lanthony. Yeah, I'll have you lean in just for me for just a second. You bet. So excellent analysis there uh, from Travis. And yeah, there's, uh, you know, it's just a pretty clear inverse relationship there. The, the corn bushels have gotten more expensive, but, you know, feeders have, feeders have moved down a fair, a fair amount here. So, you know, uh, for the, for the, the person feeding, finishing cattle that, you know, 
is there an opportunity there? There, there, there could be. Uh, it, you know, it really depend on where the, where the, you know, where the, where those input costs go um, as we move forward here. But uh, yeah, there, there's a case that this, you know, this grain rally uh, could could continue, and that that'll put that'll continue to put pressure there uh, for the for the cow calf operator uh, operation. Um, you know, I'd I'd mostly be sitting on my hands there. Um, you know, see see where this thing goes. I wouldn't feel any need to. To, to probably take any action right now. We had a question come in uh, from uh, a Facebook viewer that wanted to know, um, are tariffs or how are tariffs uh, impacting positive or negative uh, the US ag sector? Um, do either one of you wanna take a stab at that? You can take a stab at it. So earlier in the marketing year, we've seen a lot of these tariffs, you know, specifically uh, China with a, with, a, with a trade war, um, you know, I like to use the analogy that I, I think I think the grocery carts are empty in China and and I think they're filling the cart right and so there's a there's there's this political agenda uh, depending on what side you want to discuss which that's for a different different subject different time day um, but it, it's it's clear to us here at Sunrise that, that China needs to buy the product they need to buy you know and, and a lot of people are asking about you know is China going to meet their phase one obligation um, I think China meets. The demand that you know what they need, right? So they're going to buy what they need to buy. Um, you know, there's some thoughts that there's a, there's purchases going on right now ahead of the election. Um, you know, so that they, you know, if if it doesn't go the way that they want it to go, uh, perhaps maybe they'll they'll sit on the sideline for a few months and see if if they can get a you know negotiate a better deal with with uh, the current um, uh, you know president. Um, the other thing is, you know, when you look outside of just China and you start looking at, you know, you know the Black Sea, specifically, you know, Russia and wheat, um, there's talk, there's talks now with their declining wheat conditions that, and there, you know, there's parts of Russia that are, you know, 40 year droughts, like they're the driest in, in 40 plus years. And you see, you see, you know, the Southern Plains, you know, suffering with, with crop conditions and crop scores. I think one of the lowest crop conditions, you know, the start the, the U.S. hard winter wheat belt at 30 something percent, you know, good to excellent state. So uh, Russia's talking about parts of, parts of Russia talking about, you know, implementing, you know, tariffs on their exports to, to decrease the encouragement of, uh, of their export program, um, which would, uh, which obviously would help the U.S. Um, demand for U.S. wheat. The one thing I think that you gotta be careful on too is that the Black Sea has, has done a good job of producing uh, wheat They've done a good job of, of being the source, the primary source of wheat for the world. The U.S. is the secondary, uh, the residual supply of wheat. And I think they're going to fight pretty hard in order to keep that business. So, uh, again, even though we're looking out our back door and our back window and seeing this drought and this, this, these uneven stands to start to crop, you know, you got July wheat futures pushing that $6 mark. Um, uh, sometimes your, your most uncomfortable sales become your best sales. And so, um, because your neighbors probably aren't making that decision, so we th we think we think there's some there's some tax implications and some and some tariffs that people are talking about, but I, again, I think people are going to you know fight hard for their for their uh, export programs. Overall, in general, I mean, uh, how does we we haven't talked a lot about the pork side of things, but I mean, I think about some of the issues going on. Uh, in other parts of the world, it, and just a shift with the African swine fever, for example, in China, does that present opportunities for maybe other proteins like beef uh, now that we have trade resuming and China is purchasing some U.S. beef uh, to increase some opportunities and then ultimately provides a little price support for producers here? Again, I, yeah, I think that's a, a great question, a great point. I think a lot of it has to do with the economy, right? So as 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 different parts of the world like China have have increased their economies over the last three and four and five years, they've been uh, been able to afford a higher uh, protein source like U.S. beef or beef in general. And and I can assure you that um, an experience that I had about five six years ago, um, being able to host you know six of the largest delegates in, in China, private delegates that that that. You know, we're buying U.S. you know products. Uh, I can I can assure you firsthand that they love U.S. beef, um, and uh, you know it's it's almost like a delicacy in China where they would you know over there for them to get a whole muscle uh, steak 
is unheard of. So they get more of a, 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 a two or three or four ounce uh, shavings of, of meat. And so, again, I think it's more of a, a thought or a comment around what is the economy? Is our economies, you know, come back to life after we get back to the, the new normal, whatever that new normal is. And I think the, the you know, people tend to eat a higher protein as they have more, more, uh, more income. So, um, so I am pretty encouraged in, in both, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the beef sector and, and, uh, and hogs. Um, and obviously we've seen part of, part of our, you know, strong demand for us commodities and, and grain in particular is, I think, I think we underestimated how quick, uh, China got their, 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 um, numbers of, of hogs back in order, uh, still far from where it was, you know, pre, you know, swine flu, but, but they're gaining and they're gaining quickly and, and it's going to create some more, uh, demand for feed. Just a reminder, if you're viewing, whether it's on Facebook or on uh, the webinar on Zoom, if you have any questions, feel free to ask those as well. Uh, wrapping as we're, we're drilling down on, on these specific commodities, we haven't talked a little cotton. Um, what are some things that uh, producers need to think about as we head into the start of 2021? Uh, you, you bet. So, um, so Sunrise doesn't deal specifically with cotton, but at UMB we work with several cotton producers, and cotton seems to be a crop that uh, it, it usually pays to to get it harvested, and maybe maybe uh, keep it around a little while, or have it at the gin unpriced and to wait. And uh, it look, you know, prices have not moved in cotton uh, to the to the degree and as substantially as as maybe other commodities have. So, in general, that would be our encouragement: is that uh, you know, um, holding on to some cotton right now uh, it seems prudent. Um, it, there, there's 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 a decent chance if if history were to repeat itself that there could be some better prices ahead. So, and I definitely have dealt with some weather, uh, at least in in the Delta region, uh, the amount of hurricanes that have come up through that part of uh, the world this year is, has been incredible to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, raising, raising and marketing cotton is not for the faint of heart, but we work with some tremendous folks who, who've, who've made, you know, who've built great farms and sustained great farms for, for generations uh, around cotton. So absolutely. Gentlemen, as we start to wind down, um, any closing, any other thoughts, any other things we need to touch on this evening or closing comments? Well, I'll, I'll maybe uh, lead off there, and and first I'd like to thank Travis. We haven't had to talk over each other, so so that's that's been refreshing. Hopefully, maybe for our viewers. But um, you know, we we do at UMB. We 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 are really privileged to work with some tremendous customers, and this is this is a topic that that's almost always part of our discussions as we meet with folks. You know, how do we improve on marketing? How do we think about marketing? You know, I, we were flat footed in the last rally and, it, you know, we, we were busy in the field and so it got away from us. So we've attempted and, and through um, events such as this and introducing people to, to folks like Travis, um, we're, we're wanting to be proactive and, and offer good counsel ourselves, but also acknowledge our limitations that, you know, we don't, we eat, sleep and breathe agriculture and we eat, sleep and breathe uh, serving our customers and prioritizing meeting their needs in a banking relationship. But we understand that we have limitations that, that you know, we do not study the, the commodity markets day in and day out. And we believe in knowing where our circle of competence is and knowing its boundaries and staying within that. So when we know something, hey, you know, there's somebody else who might give you the very best counsel here or give you good advice over long periods of time. Um, we want to introduce uh, people to those folks. So I, I might be right twice a decade in, in marketing grain, but that would be similar to the broken clock being right twice a day. So um, we do uh, have opinions and, and we have principles that we encourage people in that hit singles and doubles and to you know, not become complacent you know, when, when things move up and to remember the price that you dreamed of, you know, because oftentimes the price you dreamed of becomes a reality and it's replaced by a new dream. And so, you know, some of those things we encourage people to avoid. But when we get into the granular, the nitty gritty, like what's moving this market? Why is it moving? What's the fundamental picture? 
uh, what's the word on the street in terms of you know the big buyers of these products? What are they thinking and doing? We love to introduce people if they if they haven't yet um, uh, kind of have somebody on their team in terms of a marketing expert. We have folks we introduce them to um, and and kind of encourage them that way. And so we're appreciative, of course, Megan, to you and Brownfield for the chance to do this and, and uh, very much appreciate Travis's um, working with us tonight and the thoughts that he shared. So. Yeah. I feel like success is always built on great relationships. So it, it's wonderful to be able to share this conversation with both of you and, and uh, to uh, those that have submitted questions and, and folks that are viewing because it is important to have these conversations. So that being said, Travis, we'll let you wrap up with the final word. Yeah, perfect. So again, I, I echo what Lance said and, and thank you, Megan and, and Brownfield for the, the great opportunity and the, uh, the positive feedback that Lance uh, shared. Um, again, I, I, I'll leave you with this is, is, is that um, making decisions are, are difficult. And 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 late and making decisions, you know, though you have to make them. If you if you don't make a decision, you're making a decision. So um, um, work with with work with an advisor, work with a consultant that you trust, and that you know that they're that they're in your corner, that they're part of an extension of your operation. And I think uh, it's a it's a it's a better win win feel when you know you got somebody you know you know talking you know you know, for you and not, you know, you know, not you versus them or them versus you. And, and that's what we look at at Sunrise. We look at, we're trying to find those win-win scenarios. Um, again, helping those, those guys and gals making, you know, uh, uh, informed decisions based on, on their individual uh, needs um, can be very, really, really important. And again, diversification from, you know, you know, risk management, just diversification. Uh, we stress those here at Sunrise. Um, you know, small incremental sales, 10, 15, 20% type of recommendations. Um, and, and then again, I think finding that, that trusting relationship, that transparent relationship, uh, somebody that's going to challenge you, right? You, you, you want people that, you know, help you, you know, challenge to be, become a better manager, a better decision maker and a, be, a better business you know, person. And, and I think if you, if you, again, if you, if you heard nothing or remember nothing about the conversation is that, um, Marketing grain is tough and, and don't feel alone. Don't feel uh, intimidated by some of these, these decisions um, because 80% of the grain gets sold in the bottom 30, 20, 30% of the market. And so um, having folks like Sunrise or other marketing advisors, they're probably going to do better than the average farmer. And so uh, admitting, admitting defeat probably is, is pretty humbling. Uh, and I know these markets this year in 2020 have been humbling if, if nothing uh, is, is, is is less than and than that is that uh, the the market you know about the time you think you have it figured out the market tends to humble people but uh, find that relationship rely on it trust it and and then follow through. Gentlemen, thank you again for your time tonight for the excellent conversation and the great information. Uh, we are glad to have you and you're welcome to come back anytime. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Uh, want to find out more information or, or be able to connect with you, what's uh, an easy way for them to do so? All right. So uh, you can look on our webpage. It's sunriseabs.com. And that is, again, it's www.sunriseabs.com. Um, our phone number is 785-301-1164. Uh, and again, we're in Hayes, Kansas, Salina, Kansas, and Kansas City. And at UMB, of course, you can connect with us at umb.com slash ag. You could follow us on Twitter, or you could always reach out to me via email, which is lance.albin at umb.com. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, for more information, to watch this back, if you missed anything, visit our website, brownfieldagnews.com. I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield. <laughs>